Okay, so welcome everyone to Health of People, Health of the Planet, a diverse of perspectives. In case you are wondering from the program, I'm not Dr. Jerome Lewis. Jerome got stuck on a delayed flight, and as today is my lucky day, I was gifted with the privilege of joining this beautiful panel. I am Dr. Grace Iara Souza. I was born in an indigenous territory called Pindorama, which I believe you probably know as Brazil. I'm a research fellow at King's College London, and a Latin America affiliate at Synchronicity Earth and one of the biggest fans of flourishing diversity. And it is a pleasure to learn from our panelists today and our audience as well, as I'm sure you will engage. So thank you so much all for joining. Um, I believe you can all hear me. Yes, okay, wonderful. So this event, Health of People, Health of the Planet, a diversity of perspectives, um, is part of one of a four part series jointly organized by Flourishing Diversity, the Welcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health at the University of Exeter and the Welcome Center for Ethics and Humanities. This event series has two intentions, to build bridges between communities working within the fields of public health medicine, the environment, climate change, and beyond, and to explore the interdriven threats of planetary health and human health with an interdisciplinary and inter international approach. We will have time for questions at the end, so please add your questions uh, into the chat, and later on we will um, select them um, and raise them uh, to our panelists. And we have the incredible Nicole Hedwars, Pat McBee, and Lucy Sabuva, uh, ready to guide us through this conversation today. So thank you all so much. And we are delighted to start with Nicole. Um, Dr. Nicole uh, is a member of the Denu Kuni First Nation and has worked with various indigenous patients and communities around the globe, helping to bridge the gap between traditional and modern medical systems. She is an associate professor at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of North Dakota and a co-founder and past chair of the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation based in the Canadian North. Um, Dr. Hedward sits on the Can Canada Research Coordination Committee's Indigenous Leadership Circle in Research, is a commissioner at the Lancelet Com Commission on the Arctic Health, sits on the steering committee for the Plenary Health Alliance based out of Harvard, and sits on the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada Task Force on the effects of climate change and health. Nicole, please over to you. I believe we will see your screen soon. And thanks for that. And just to clarify, I'm at the University of Western Ontario now, although I was uh, previously at the University of North Dakota, and, and really happy to be here. <laughs> I've been blessed to uh, be present on uh, Haudenosaunee territory for the last uh, bit, but uh, previously, of course, on Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota territories. Um, my community is the Deninukwe First Nation up in Denede, or Tree 8 territory in subarctic Canada. And one of the things that's important in terms of noting very clearly is that my Indigenous ways of being, my Indigenous ways of knowing, and my lived experience has been informed by tens of thousands of years of memories that are stored in my region's stories. And 
stories are our main method, so to speak, and, and directly rooted uh, within the lands that we come from. And I, I really love this quote by George Kajadi, who really aptly describes this relationship by stating that the culture's vitality is literally dependent on individuals in community with the natural world. Indigenous cultures are an extension of the story of the natural community of a place and evolve according to ecological dynamics and natural relationships. So because of this, I must always honor my ancestors and my elders as anything I share or talk about from my indigenous way of being is, is not my knowledge, it's not my expertise. It, this is a collective way of knowing of a group of people that stretches thousands of years within my home community region. Now, our indigenous methodologies for well-being could be said to stem from a rooted decolonized state of being that is premised on four R's described by Kirkness and Barnhart, that of which is respect, relevance, reciprocity, responsibility, with direct underpinnings and transferability to our kinship, kinship relationships with all planetary elements and beings. Now, this idea of how we formulate our relationships are rooted in a framework of knowing that prizes interconnectedness as a fundamental component. So how do you turn this interconnected relationship to land with a capital L? And I denote that in terms of a strength base, land not in a mere geographic sense, but in a relational sense. How do we turn this interconnected relationship to land into a methodology for health and well-being. Well, of course, there's already a methodology. There's been a healing method in existence for thousands of years and how to live and heal sustainably. And all are based on sacred natural law or first laws, which then define our traditional protocols or guidelines for living in a good way, which then give a framework for the modern world scholarship healing, but also governance. So considering my indigenous approach, planetary health is a terminology that I often frame my work in, really is a field, however, that is primarily a Western construct as indigenous traditional knowledge systems have no clear separation between the health of the planet and the health of ourselves or that of the community and ecosystem at large. So this means that the innate meaning and applications of planetary health, planetary healing, are directly rooted in our community values based on our protocols for living in harmony with all that have existed for thousands of years. So when we think about planetary health, especially from an Indigenous perspective, we can think of it as being embodied into this interconnected relationship with other types of innate and applied knowledges within our communities, which then impact the health of our communities and ecosystems. So there's this bi-directional or multi-directional impact of various nested levels and, and this, this concept of directionality is really important as we think through forming our reality, just as much as we, were, we are bound by some natural constants. Now, recently, a group of global indigenous scholars, practitioners, land and water defenders, respected elders and knowledge holders came together to define the determinants of planetary health from an indigenous perspective. Now, of course, we, we often hear about the social determinants of health, which are well known as the non-medical factors that influence our health outcomes, anywhere from conditions in which we are born, grow, work, live, and, and even age. And these wider sets of forces and systems really shaping the conditions of our daily life. Um, one of the you know, incredible components of social de determinants is that it's not to be minimized. <laughs> However, it was realized very clearly that Mother Earth was being left out of the equation as a living and breathing relative. So we wanted to, for once, place Mother Earth in the center and consider what are the determinants that keep her well? What are the factors that will impact her well-being? And I just want to highlight here a few of the determinants that I think are uh, less well appreciated in wider environment and health circles. And I won't, won't go into detail, of course, on all of them, and we'll encourage you to see the paper online. If you're interested, it's available open access at no charge. Now, the first 
key one that I want to highlight is human interconnectedness within nature as a determinant. And we as a group wrote very clearly that ecological demise points to our impaired human relationship with its inner self, because humans are nature. We are not apart from it. We are in and of itself nature. So in the broader sense, there's this evidence we have of, a, of the loss of an ecologically bound cultural identity. And this disconnect from nature manifests as a fragmented and disassociated identity that cannot recognize itself as part of a larger system, making it much easier to project predatory and abusive impulses onto the environment. Thus, this ideology of independence has really resulted in a sense of entitled ownership, a kind of perception of the natural world that relates to it through transactional relationships that do not have a sense of responsibility, care, or love. And this worldview will only continue to perpetuate planetary harm. Now, the other less appreciated determinant of planetary health that I want to highlight is that of Indigenous peoples' health globally. And we premise very strongly in our group that the health of the planet is intrinsically tied to the health and well-being of Indigenous peoples. Because when Indigenous peoples have their land and land rights, when they have their culture, when we have our sovereignty and self-determination, they are more likely to have greater well-being. And thus, they will be able to continue to sustainably care for more than a third of the world's old growth forests and the remaining 80% of the biodiversity left on the planet. So it's imperative that Indigenous peoples' health is approached from a holistic lens that acknowledges cultural and land-based practices as being crucial for human health and for the health of the planet. Now I noted it's becoming very well known that Indigenous peoples currently host 80% of the remaining biodiversity left on the globe. Indigenous peoples make up 6% of the global population. So 6% of the global population is caretaking 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Maybe Indigenous peoples are doing something right. We concluded our paper stating that Indigenous voices are a powerful and beneficial solutions oriented force for Mother Earth's well being and for all living beings that inhabit her. We therefore call for an inclusion of wisdom that is not mere knowledge or information, but is an insight that comes from the heart, from the heart of Mother Earth. We currently have elaborate plans from the local to the international level to tackle the social and ecological determinants of our own health. However, let's not forget about the determinants of planetary health, specifically in this story. Let's codify an equitable narrative that really sets us on a path to better relations with ourself, with others, but also with the planet. Because I premise very clearly that we cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place, as it will continue to perpetuate a disconnect between us and the planet as relatives. Now, how can we think about bridging some of these determinants of planetary health into health promotion or even research? And I've highlighted a number of the determinants of planetary health listed here from the consensus process, as they are determinants that can be more easily bound into certain types of health programming and research agendas. And with this, I want to introduce very briefly the terminology of land-based healing here, as land-based healing can take place when we return or reconnect to the land. And I use land in the sense of not only the earth beneath us, but including the waters, the air, uh, the people, the rocks, all encompassing in that term terminology of land. Um, reconnecting to land while utilizing supports to relearn, revitalize, and reclaim our traditional wellness practices. And this is because the land is foundational to our identity, but over generations of colonization, we have been disconnected and dispossessed from our traditional ways of being. Now, land-based health or healing is often a term used to designate a formal or informal health or healing practice program or service that takes place on a land base that has been intentionally spiritually cultivated to ensure the land is honored and respected. And this is very clear. The land has been intentionally spiritually cultivated to ensure the land is honored and respected. 
And another key component of land-based healing is that the land as situated in our indigenous worldview is understood to be an active host and partner to the person or people engaged in the healing process. Again, we are in and of nature. We are not going out uh, you know, to, to, to have this one directional experience. Land is an active host and partner to the person or people engaged in the healing process. So with this in, this in mind, I, I want to talk very briefly about a health promotion project that we started in the subarctic of Canada. We have formalized an urban land-based healing camp in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, which is in the northern regions of Canada, one of the first in Canada or the United States to be located in an urban center. We engaged elders from the region, ensuring that traditional protocols of the region were followed in the design implementation, but also the oversight of the project. And really the overarching goal of the camp was to combine Indigenous cultural education with traditional Indigenous therapeutic and wellness interventions in a wilderness urban setting to favorably impact the health and wellness of marginalized Indigenous peoples in the region, keeping in mind the determinants of planetary health, Indigenous peoples' health. Now, we curated traditional structures that were purposefully built not only to ensure cultural representation of the peoples within the region, but also to ensure the land atmosphere itself permeated the experience for visitors with sights, smells, sounds, and textures. So you walk into the place and you're reminded of your grandmother's cabin. And I love this quote from a participant that was given to us and shared by us. <laughs> on their experience coming to our, our urban land-based healing camp. And the camp participant said, although on the edge of the city, each step down the path leaves the city behind, the sounds of traffic are replaced with the sounds of birds, the crunching of the gray gravel beneath my feet. My spirit feels lighter as I approach the camp. There's a feeling of peacefulness here, a place where you can feel the warmth of the fire on your face, the popping, crackling, and smell of the fire brings a calmness, a feeling of openness. You are safe here. You can talk here. You can listen here. In reflecting on local to planetary health promotion, the urban land-based healing camp operated by the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation as a case study demonstrating how the determinants of Indigenous people's health and the determinants of planetary health can be cross-conceptualized and implemented with benefits felt at individual, community, and also planetary levels. And land-based healing also embodies a key worldview that impacts many things in the world, some of which I spoke to at the beginning uh, when I started talking. Because the lens of the world we use affects how we see our innate hierarchy of ourselves over all other beings on the planet, including patients, how we conceptualize research questions, and how we think of developing day-to-day -day projects. This ego, I, or anthropocentric or human-centric conception of humans being on top comparatively to more of this cosmocentric ecocentric, eco-we, humans being a part of a greater system and one small part of a greater system. Now, thankfully, health equity considerations in research and practice are, are thankfully becoming more common in, in modern conversation and discourse. But what's also important as denoted here is an interspecies equity approach that is seen from a place of relationality or relationship. We are all interconnected with no hierarchy between us when it comes to how the natural systems operate in the world. So how does our view of hierarchy carry over into research practice? You may have noticed that the modern scientific paradigm was listed as a determinant of planetary health. Why was this? We stated very specifically that Western science as a paradigm has historically been limited in ex explaining complex relationships over time, and in many cases may be described as linear, reductionistic, and mechanistic. And the overarching interest of Western science has often been to infer phenomenon to understand the world. However, there is this underlying implicit interest to find ways to influence control, and perhaps even modify these phenomena for human benefit. Now, there's an underappreciated 
connection to indigenous science coming through in this new 21st century, really starting a swing towards systems oriented ecologically based and networking approaches. And this approach might in fact seem more aligned to the complexity of planetary health and, and other complex systems with which we interrelate because the indigenous scientific method itself could be described as contextual, holistic, symbolic, nonlinear, relational, is not limited by time, and uses the collective observation of its people to explain natural phenomena through real and also metaphoric narratives. So with this, we need to stop the narrative of aligning so-called separate sectors such as human, animal, and planetary health, but instead better seek to focus, describe, and operationalize the interconnectedness between systems with a focus on relationships between variables as opposed to the variables themselves, while of course being inclusive of traditional indig indigenous knowledge systems that embody this way of science innately. And we'll have a better chance of dealing in my mind with our multiple crises, including the pandemic, biodiversity loss, pollution, but of course, climate change. We need more indigenous presence and more indigenous voices amplifying and also leading through thought experiments and real-time implementations of solutions on the ground. We need Western systems to finally stand up and step back and listen to the longest stewards of the land. An elder from the Western part of Canada reminds uh, us that we are born with two ears and, and one mouth for a reason. So why is this Im important for me to state? I think of the words of Chief Dan George, who was a chief of the Sitsle Watu First Nation. And he said, allow me to learn the ways of your book knowledge so that I may combine it with my natural knowledge and lead the way. We as Indigenous peoples often understand that a blend of traditional knowledge with modern knowledge is the way forward sustainably for the planet. And I emphasize here the concept of epistemological pluralism. It's a complex term, epistemological pluralism, but it recognizes that in any given practice context, there may be several valuable ways of knowing, and that accommodating this plurality can lead to more successful integrative uh, study, but also solutions and practice. So regardless, as we think through the next critical steps we take as a human race, I'm reminded of the words of Anne Paulina, a Nikonina were a traditional custodium from the Matarara Lower Fitzroy River in Western Australia that states, although Mother Earth is a living system that can transform and heal herself, she will be lonely without the vibrations of her human family. So I'd like to uh, wrap up today with this quote from Terry T.G., a member of the Takla Lake First Nation, who simply but powerfully stated, take care of the land and the land will take care of you. Indigenous knowledges remind us how to walk in the world in a good way. The path we hopefully decide to walk is together with Mother Earth as our relative. So with this, I want to say Masi Cho, thank you for your time and attention today. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you all, um, as well as the organizers and fellow panelists. I, I look forward to the coming presentations by the other panelists in the discussion. And I want to apologize to uh, el my elder Pat for uh, speaking before her. Masi Cho, thank you. Masicho Nicole, thank you so much uh, for this very insightful presentation. And please, everybody, hold your thoughts, <laughs> or even better, start uh, adding the notes to the chat um, and your questions as well. We will get back to them at the end of the panel. I would like to now introduce our next, next speaker, uh, Pat uh, McBee. Uh, she's a Dinegra mother, activist, artist, and international speaker. Uh, her primary work is proposing to the five fingerhead ones. Uh, the paradigm, paradigm is a choice and pointing to indigenous cultures as examples that we have evidence that human beings can participate in paradigms in which we can become beings capable of causing all life to thrive. Pat, cannot wait to hear you. Thank you for joining us. I'll try to keep the blazing sun off of us. I have sunrise happening right behind me, but I think I can remain seated here as long as I don't move my head. <laughs> 
Um, so I guess it's good afternoon to you. Uh, as I said, it's sunrise here at my home in northern New Mexico. Um, I'm uh, just on the edge of my traditional territory, Diné, Diné, Dineta, Diné Nation, um, but also uh, squarely on the territory of the Red Willow people at Taos Pueblo here. Um, I'll introduce myself by saying, um, so much to think about, so much to think about there. Thank you uh, for that presentation, Nicole. Um, so the things that were coming to mind for me to talk about in this relationship between, I guess, health and and when we say that, we generally are talking in, in that title um, about human health and ecosystems and um, planetary health. Um, so one thing that I have uh, been considering for a long time, and this has to do with my own journey from moving out of um, an intellectual conceptualized world that I was raised in academically and moving into a more embodied way of living um, here on the land. And, and this land um, that I'm in now really, really healed, healed, my, healed my soul, healed my heart, healed my mind um, because that fierce intellectual and conceptual way of being a human being was really um, sad for me. And as a young person, I couldn't, I, I, I really felt like if this, is, if this is what there is for being a human being, I'm not sure that I can do it. I'm not sure I want to do it. <laughs> and I'm gonna say that I feel like I'm watching this being reflected in many young people today. Um, and so, you know, I, I think about how being a human being is presented to our young people at this point. And, um, you know, the, the economic outlook is pretty daunting for them. The ecological outlook is probably quite overwhelming for them. I mean, I just have to remember that as a young person, I, all, all of the global problems that were presented to me um, were also presented with this sense that, you know, oh, well, we can figure this out. We're, we're gonna work this out. It's an ideological issue. And um, it's just a matter of time before we all come into alignment and, and uh, all these different issues can be resolved. But right now, what we're presenting to our young people is that we don't know, we don't know. And, um, and so just thinking about that, that stress level for, for our young people right now, and to me, that's, that's a huge measure of, of our health and well-being. So oftentimes, I'll start by saying, you know, what I say to the young people uh, when I have a chance to speak to them, uh, is I say, you've got to want your life. You've got to want your life like this. You've got to want it. You've got to really want it. Because you're gonna need that. You're gonna need that fierce wanting of your life for everything that's moving and everything that's coming our way, opportunities and challenges. And so I tell them, you know, whatever it is that makes you want your life, <laughs> follow that, follow that. And then what I end up saying to their chaperones or the adults around them, as I end up saying to them, and guess what? You've got to want your life. You've got to want your life like this. You've got to want it. How can we ask these young people to want their life if you don't want your life? How can I ask them to want their life if I don't want my life? And so I, Make it quite personal that way to help us recognize 
the place that we're in as a human being in these systems and what's being presented to us. So, you know, I was looking at the hierarchical paradigm there, and I often use that figure when I'm speaking too, I'm talking about the power over paradigm is how I call it. And in the power over paradigm, um, you must overcome another in order to have what you need. That's how it works. That's how you actually succeed in there. And we're taught that from a very, very young age. Even in kindergarten, you know, we have first place, second place, third place <laughs> for different for different things. I mean, these we're five years old and we need to be competing with each other. Um, we compete for scholarships, we compete for so many things. So we're so we're taught right away that it's good to have a singular um, brilliant idea, like that's the goal, or 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 if not a singular brilliant genius idea to present to the world that where you leave your lasting mark, then you have a singular brilliant idea for how to get rich quickly. Those are the main things that are set before us, I would say, in order to be able to, to navigate this power over paradigm. And so I say this power over paradigm um, is not conducive to cooperation or collaboration. It's designed for competition. And so, you know, for myself, moving, moving from, um, you know, my father went to Stanford University, my brother went to Stanford University, my daughter, my niece, my nephew, um, moving out of that track and moving up here to Northern New Mexico and sort of abandoning that track really for my whole life since, since I was 20, I guess it was. But it took me a full 10 years to release it. I guess what I can describe about that, not only, so just as a human being moving back to land, not, not necessarily even engaging my, my cultural standing, um, you know, what I discovered was that my, I had to release um, a kind of torture for my mind, a kind of um, unsettledness in my, in my body, um, and just waking up to this idea that it was enough to be waking up with this sunrise, working with the water in a very particular special way that the water travels across this land. They're called acequias, so they water coming out of the mountains um, into these ditches that, that were dug by human beings generations ago. They have names, they have family lineages. We have accountability to our neighbors to make sure that the water is flowing through across the land. Uh, it's hard to describe what happened to me, this fierce academic, <laughs> um, to just move with earth and water and land. And so it took quite a long time to, to release that world and to stop dreaming about it even, and to become present here. So at this point, I wanna introduce this, this will be my PowerPoint. <laughs> this is, um, some people call it a medicine wheel. Some people call it, um, I call it the sacred hoop, the sacred hoop of life. And this particular one, uh, this is a, there are similar maps of reality, I guess you could say, that different peoples um, have and they use different colors or different designs. This particular one comes out of Lakota, spiritual understanding, the colors, colors indicate that. But what I want us to notice here is this is describing a different paradigm. This isn't describing the power over paradigm. This is describing an interrelated view of who we are, where we are, how it is. And when I think about every single member of life getting to have a seat on this sacred hoop and noticing that I as a human being also get to have a seat on this sacred hoop, it's, it's humbling. And, and for me at this point, it's actually comforting. <laughs> to feel that, to feel that relatedness. 
And so what I've been noticing about this, I mean, this, this, the teaching of this is, is endless. It's speaking to the four cardinal directions and what we understand lies cosmologically or spiritually or, or even geographically in the four directions from our center point. And, and we can have more than one center of the universe. Um, that's a complexity that's hard for <laughs> Western science sometimes to, to grapple with, but that's, this is also indicating that. Um, it's speaking about the four stages of our life, moving from youth to adulthood to uh, responsible parenting and community member and, and then elder. Um, but when I think about every life form being given a seat here on this hoop, and I, and I, I, I realize that every single member has, to, has a role to play to keep the integrity of this hoop. Every single member of life has a perfect design to uphold their part. And this is something that I've been studying deeply for the last, I don't know, 15 years is okay. So if I, as a human being, am given a place on this sacred hoop, what do I know about my perfect design for thriving life? What do I know about my perfect design that can contribute to supporting the well being, health of every other member of this hoop? Because when any member doesn't uphold their part of the hoop, then the integrity of the hoop begins to fail. And so that's another way of looking at our current situation is that there are, well, there's one standout kind of member <laughs> who's not upholding their part of this sacred hoop, but the cascading um, uh, consequences of that, you know, our activities are actually very, because we've been so um, focused only on our own part of the hoop or our own contributions or our own presence, our actions actually have been preventing other members of this hoop from enacting their perfect design for thriving life. So it's a cascading um, issue around this, the integrity of this hoop here. So, you know, as I've been moving back into my own culture, Diné, come from Diné Nation, but was also raised um, into the Lakota spiritual way of life. So I draw upon both of those ways to, to think about myself as a human being here. Um, you know, I think how, how, can I, how can I participate in this upholding of, of, of life, you know? So before we, so, so, so let me go back to this part about this sense of well-being that has come from being with the land. So the more that I understand how deeply embedded I am in the, in, in, in the, the, the land, in, in the water, in the, the sky, um, the more my purpose shifts the more what my presence here means shifts. My presence here isn't about conquering or competing. My presence becomes one of wanting to harmonize. And so as I was listening to um, the previous presentation there, I was thinking about how, you know, moving, living a ceremonial life, which is a way of, understanding my perfect design for thriving life. The ceremonies inform us and they inform me in my role, but they also inform us as community about how to participate in thriving life paradigm in the location that we find ourselves. So I say culture is not um, a human construct. Culture is the mother earth actually expressing herself as human being in any given place. So that's what I want to align with here, is I want to align with what is that expression of human being here? And what I find is the, the deeper I go into that inquiry, the more I wake up saying to myself, <laughs> I'm looking forward to this day. You know, I want my life. I have a different kind of collaborative purpose. And, and I think um, a previous speaker said, you know, I have it, I have it in my DNA. But I'm going to say, I think the human being has it in their DNA to be a collaborator, to be a cooperator, to be a communal being. 
And the last point that I want to bring up here before I before I stop is to say that um, so looking at the landscape from this perspective changes my ability, my capacity for health and well-being. And I just want to point out that right now we're faced with not only a power over paradigm, but within that power over paradigm, we're also being presented our children. Our children are being presented so deeply with virtual reality. So that's kind of a big topic to throw in right at the end here, but I wanted to be sure to have us notice, what does that mean? What does that mean to be staring at a screen in which a certain kind of reality, a certain uh, message, a certain scenario of what it is to be human, is where our young people's minds are spending their time hour after hour after hour on that screen. And so this is another part of environmental health uh, that I'm watching is to see how to, how do we move our young people back to even looking at this earth and not the screen. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Grandma Pat. Um, it, it's just really fascinating uh, that we started, we departed our journey with Nicole um, talking us through um, the differences between um, anthropo anthropocentrism and cosmos cosmocentrism and Grandma Pat take us to <laughs> an illustration of what cosmocentrism means. So it feels very blessing um, and a beautiful encounter here. So again, hold your thoughts or write them down in the chat um, because it promises to be an exciting discussion later. I would like now to um, invite our next uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Sabuva who is an interdisciplinary social scientist based at the university's European Center for Environment and Human Health. Her research explores interaction and feedback between society and the environment. Broadly speaking, she employs qualitative and participatory methods and approaches to co-produce an understanding of socially differentiated experiences of well-being and resilience in the context of changing climate and environmental conditions. She strives to promote the integration of underrepresented and marginalized voices into policy process. Um, Lucy, we cannot wait to hear you. Um, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Grace. Um, I'm just having uh, issues sharing my screen, so um, I don't know if it's uh, okay to uh, enable sharing or um, maybe Charlotte with... Okay, Laura says she's working on it. Um, <clears throat> Um, but in any case, so I'll leave it. I'd just like to say um, that thank you to the other two speakers and certainly set the bar really high. So I hope I can uh, um, I can deliver, um, you know, similarly, um, hopefully interesting and um, helpful insights in what's to come. Um, OK, and I've got my screen sharing, I think, sorted. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see the screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And um, it's truly a, a pleasure to, uh, to be able to join today. Um, and in this presentation, I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to explore the connections between uh, the well-being of uh, humans and the well-being of the environment in um, urban social ecological systems. Um, and um, I'm going to look at the role of policy and other structural factors in mediating this relationship 
and hopefully highlight the importance and opportunities for integrating marginalized voices uh, into policy uh, processes. Um, okay. So I just need to sort my... Uh, Um, so uh, in recent decades, we have witnessed um, a demographic shift uh, manifesting pro progressive um, rural depopulation and accelerating uh, urban growth in many developing countries. Um, as we speak, already half of the world's population can be found in cities, and this is projected to increase to around 70% by 2050. Um, this is symptomatic of um, development and industrialization, uh, including the emergence of new economic sectors and opportunities uh, in urban centers, um, as well as uh, the growing uncertainty of rural agricultural livelihoods um, in, in the context of climate and environmental change processes. Um, and in this context, uh, migration is often employed as a livelihood diversification strategy, um, much of uh, migration takes place um, within countries and, and uh, especially to cities. And indeed, migration is one of the factors that's driving this rapid urbanization. Um, Bangladesh, uh, the country that I'm going to focus on uh, in this presentation, has not been immune to these processes um, either. Uh, in 2021, uh, already um, uh, already around 40% of the population was living in cities um, and, and this is set to increase rapidly over the coming decades. Uh, and in particular, uh, the research that I'm going to be talking to you about today uh, was uh, undertaken in uh, Chittagong or Chattogram as it's retaken uh, its uh, um, pre-colonial name, uh, which can be found in the Bay of Bengal, um, is, is a city that's attracting um, a large amount of uh, internal migrants in Bangladesh. Uh, and it's also an example of, of new opportunities, new sectors, uh, which have been attracted by its uh, favorable location being uh, the main port of the country. Um, so there is a vast uh, ready-made garment and other manufacturing sector, as well as a large export processing zone. Um, and and um, map is just illustrating um, for any, anyone who's not um, familiar with uh, Bangladesh. Um, Okay, and then so in, in the sense, uh, migration is often seen uh, as an opportunity by those who move, uh, as an opportunity to improve lives and livelihoods, to gain education and to help families back in rural origins. Um, however, for many, migration merely replaces one set of hazards uh, with another uh, when they move to cities. Um, and they encounter new forms of uh, precarity in the city. Um, which is epitomized by being concentrated in densely populated um, neighborhoods or marginal lands uh, where they are disproportionately exposed to um, environmental hazards, um, as well as other forms of exclusion um, manifest in lack of citizenship rights, insecure incomes, um, also social um, exclusion and discrimination in urban societies. Uh, and in particular, um, as um, others also mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare some uh, the extremely vulnerable situation of many rural to urban migrants um, uh, who were unable to access social protection in times of um, dire need. In the context of policy, um, urban development uh, planning um, policy, othering discourses often justify exclusionary policies that create hostile environments so as to deter people from moving to cities uh, to make uh, these as unattractive places to move to. Uh, while clearly they have not been successful in uh, achieving this, uh, what they have uh, achieved or what they do achieve uh, is that they lead to inequality and marginalization um, and undermine um, urban sustainability going forward. Um, many low skill migrants um, are exposed to um, high levels of environmental hazards, as I've just mentioned, by virtue of what, where um, they live uh, and also where they work. Uh, yet they lack recognition and representation in policies that fail to incorporate their lived experiences of social exclusion, marginal 
uh, material hardship, sorry, and exposure to environmental hazards. Um, and these policies uh, and addressing these uh, policies and exclusions uh, is not just a matter of social justice. Um, it, it's also affecting how uh, people, how um, um, migrants to uh, urban centers are interacting, are able to interact with their urban environments and thus shaping uh, the well-being of, uh, of, of the urban social ecological system. Uh, therefore, it is crucial uh, for migrants uh, to participate in policy processes, and it is key to delivering legitimate and effective solutions uh, that can uh, address urban challenges uh, meaningfully. Um, political processes uh, that increase the inclusiveness of diverse perspectives uh, can uh, or have the potential to overcome injustices associated with marginalization. Uh, in particular, it's been suggested that deliberation between different stakeholders, including stakeholders uh, who hold power uh, unequally, um, can build solidarity, promote innovation, and introduce new options into planning processes. Um, and in, in, in these processes of deliberation, um, coming to consensus is, is not really uh, necessary or, or the primary aim. Uh, it's, it's really creating a safe platform uh, for dialogue, um, for uh, different perspectives to meet. Um, and creative approaches in particular can be uh, um, effective um, and efficient in terms of uh, creating this space, uh, especially where uh, power asymmetries exist. Um, for instance, and uh, due to different socioeconomic status held by uh, the stakeholders involved that we are um, looking to engage. And these include participatory methodologies um, that can um, engage with the lived experiences of uh, migrants in our case uh, to build empathy uh, between migrants and policy stakeholders. Um, and so in this project, uh, we engaged over 18 months uh, with um, migrants and, um, and um, urban planners um, in a process of uh, visual ethnography and uh, a participative process of um, perspective taking. Uh, and this is building on, um, on the recognition that uh, empathy has been proposed as a prerequisite for sustainable interactions with the natural and social environment, uh, where empathy through emotional and connected, uh, sorry, cognitive connection uh, with living and non-living beings um, can act as a moral impetus for positive action. Uh, it can instigate pro-social and poor environmental behavior. Um, empathetic individuals, in addition, who occupy positions of power or decision making can translate their empathy into action and can contribute um, to public policies that are appropriate, more just and uh, also more responsive uh, to the needs of underrepresented uh, groups uh, such as migrants. Um, and it can be also a uh, powerful pathway uh, to challenging stereotypes and reducing prejudice, which underlies uh, many of these exclusionary practices. And when marginalized and importantly, when marginalized populations have the opportunity to engage in these processes, it can also uh, be a source of um, feeling uh, empowered. And um, so, so in terms of the perspectives that we uh, gain through this process, um, both from migrants um, and, um, and also urban planners allowed us to then elicit together uh, a number of entry points for uh, possible solutions. And I'm just going to also already put the, um, um, the quote there from, uh, from participants from the workshop. Uh, so in terms of um, what migrants perceived in, um, in relation to safety in the city, they emphasized um, the environmental conditions and the working conditions and of their existence in terms of environmental conditions, especially exposure to water logging um, in low-lying urban settlements, but also 
to uh, hill slides um, in, in, in the hilly areas. And this was especially a major problem during the monsoon season and already several people have lost their lives. Um, and um, a lot of this is, um, is also problematic in the sense that a lot of the settlements are uh, erected on, on, on illegal um, land and, and uh, do not um, benefit from many of the civic services that are available in cities posing additional uh, health and also well-being hazards as well. Um, and of course, uh, through water logging itself and, and, and also the resulting waste pollution, um, there is also the risk of spread of disease and injury um, as it was exemplified um, by participants in, in, in the workshops. And then uh, working conditions, uh, again, very often working in the informal sectors, and uh, there is not really um, any sort of minimum standards or regulations. Um, and, and, and people are exposed to um, various forms of uh, pollution um, and, um, and they also they lack uh, basic things such as protective equipment at work. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just trying to do that. So um, just to also read the quote here. Uh, so in, in my workplace, there's too much warmth and dust. People get sick from it. They get emotionally, uh, sorry, they get uh, mainly fever and cold. Um, and there are no fans where we work, dust is everywhere. So that's just exemplify some of the conditions that people work um, working in the informal sector um, in that was in the context of um, recycling of scrap materials um, are facing on a daily basis. Uh, in terms of sustainability, they mentioned, uh, as I already alluded to, insecure tenure and the constant um, risk of um, eviction from their homes. Uh, and then also um, it was linked to a lack of voice or agency uh, to, to, to challenge the conditions or to do anything about them. And the secondly, their access to education and education, not just for children, but also for adults and the enabling conditions that are needed, especially in terms of, uh, for instance, childcare. Um, and I'm not going to read out all the quotes, but I'll, I'll just always put, put them up on the screen. And then in terms of um, the same from the planners' perspective, so in terms of planners, uh, they emphasize waste pollution as, a, as from, from the kind of safety perspective, but they were looking at it from a, from a slightly different angle. Um, and they sort of emphasize the, the link to human practices and, um, and inappropriate practices in terms of uh, waste disposal and also the kinds of risk that it poses then for the wider population within the city as well through um, health and also safety hazards as well. Um, and then obviously the fact that it exacerbates um, the impacts of, of, um, of water logging as well because it blocks up uh, the uh, canals uh, throughout the city. Um, and then they mentioned also street hawking, which they saw as a nuisance. Um, and in the sense that, again, it causes congestion and, and, um, and the risk of traffic related uh, safety hazards. And then in terms of sustainability, they mentioned uh, and emphasized uh, illegal land occupation, not just of land, but also waterways. And as I mentioned, um, the establishment of illegal settlements um, and also uh, lack of infrastructure, so lack of uh, basic infrastructure in terms of roads, in terms of pedestrian amenities, but also a sewage system, um, which, um, which is especially a problem um, when, for instance, water logging um, takes place. Um, but what it's important to mention is that these um, experiences, they were by no means uh, uniform, um, but they very much differed depending on age, gender, ethnicity, religious affiliation. Uh, for instance, um, in, in the sample, we had uh, migrants from uh, um, the Chakma um, ethnic and religious minority, and they come from the Chittagong Hill tracks. Um, area and um, they they were facing specific challenges around being able to practice their uh, cultural and, and, and religious practices 
and also uh, in terms of accessing uh, traditional ingredients uh, for preparing uh, their traditional foods. And then, of course, these experiences are mediated by um, structures and institutions, uh, such as, uh, for instance, social um, norms about um, behavior or, or um, perception of, of um, gendered roles, etc. Uh, and here I'd just like to mention um, some of women's experiences uh, in terms of um, a dignity in, in particular, um, a challenge that they experience due to the underserviced uh, nature of informal settlements where they really struggle to meet their needs for hygiene and sanitation. They face verbal uh, abuse and sexual harassment um, um, while, while queuing up um, to, um, to attend to their needs, for instance. And then in the case of especially younger mothers with children, um, there was the issue of trade-offs between uh, work and, and caring for children, um, but because of the low incomes, um, there was often no access to childcare, and even in a sense of sending children to school because they just could not meet those goals. Uh, so it's, it's really um, uh, exemplifying how uh, underlying vulnerabilities are further amplified uh, by, by urban uh, precarity. And as a result of these discussions and deliberations, um, the group identified a number of entry points which can be summarized uh, along three main areas. Um, and these are um, where migrants live. So their spatial distribution, which as I mentioned, um, makes them disproportionately um, exposed to some hazards. And then also um, in terms of uh, other um, aspects of, of their homes and their neighborhoods. And a few uh, suggestions that, that were proposed in this regard were around addressing corruption uh, and curbing illegal land grabs, um, but also corruption in terms of capturing um, some free services that were provided by the city, such as water, um, which, which further exacerbated access to um, possible water for, for many, um, and also subsidized housing for low-income groups, um, and, and a database of migrant numbers, which uh, planners uh, found it uh, especially difficult to plan, not really knowing um, you know, where people are and how many, how many people they need to provide for. Uh, in terms of where migrants work, so there were challenges um, in terms of work in, in um, the formal and informal sector. In the formal sector, it was mainly around access to do with education and, and lack of it thereof. Um, so education was an important uh, need to be addressed. And childcare, as I mentioned, and one proposition that was also around uh, creating a designated markets where people could um, do their sales so that way to remove the need for, um, you know, doing street hawking and, and um, occupying streets. And, um, and then also in terms of how the city works, which had sort of three areas in terms of the governance, uh, the infrastructure and, and practices, so kind of like the social organizational and, and both on physical uh, infrastructure of cities. Um, and, um, and then here, an interesting uh, one was around the lack of, um, lack of open spaces and safe spaces for people of all ages, uh, including children, to congregate, meet and socialize and play safely um, as a need that needed to be addressed. Um, but also, uh, and something that was a barrier mentioned by planners and a need for better coordination and cooperation um, between um, different agencies, including at different levels of, of uh, policy making. Um, and um, just to uh, um, finalize um, with some final thoughts. Um, so in terms of moving forward, in terms of building um, a resilient future for cities, uh, it is important to address um, vulnerability, not just as a matter of social justice, but also as a matter of climate justice as political choices that create winners and losers uh, across, uh, di across different spatial and temporal scales um, that reach beyond cities and beyond uh, the present uh, times. 
And in order for, tr uh, for truly uh, transformative and just outcomes, it is necessary to understand the root causes of differentiated vulnerability uh, and also the factors that uh, create and perpetuate these. Um, and so in the context, finally, finally in the context of uh, rapid urbanization, the integration of uh, migrant groups into urban planning and governance is key to building safe and sustainable cities as articulated in the sustainable development goals um, in agenda 2030. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much for bringing an example um, of the consequences of the impacts of historical colonization and our unbalanced relations with the capital land, uh, as said earlier, have impacted places in the global south like Bangladesh. Um, we, we, we've, we've been through a journey in, in this <laughs> Pano, which is uh, really exciting and rich, and I'm sure uh, a lot to take in uh, to our um, audience as well. So there is a space now for questions, so please add them to the chat and our colleagues, Callan, will organize the questions and as we go, but uh, while you all do that, I will take advantage of my privileged position of being a host. <laughs> Uh, to ask a few or, or incite a few more um, reflections combining um, the three talks we had so far. Um, I think the, the, the very much departing point, which I thought was really exciting um, from Nicole was very much about uh, thinking about our trans, transnational relationships uh, with, with the land and the three determinants of planetary health, which I thought uh, they're beautiful, they're beautifully uh, put together. And of course, most important, the lens based healing uh, element is our return to this process. And I think quite interesting, and even now after Lucy's uh, presentation, thinking um, of borrowing another scholar's uh, concept, Jason Moore, Capitolocene. So it feels like, you know, rather than the Anthropocene, we are living a Capitolocene, um, as opposed to this cosmocentrism um, that um, uh, uh, Nicole invited us to, to think and Grandma Pat uh, beautifully uh, illustrated to all of us here. So I, I wonder now, you know, after all these exposures and um, reflections that I'm sure you all had, if our panelists would like to perhaps um, add additional thoughts or even questions to each other, um, considering um, these different presentations, which in a way take us to, to all those senses. And, and Lucy, I thought that was quite interesting as well, the, the fact that you brought empathy to, to the discussion. And I wonder if this element of empathy is not very much connected with what Grandma um, Pat said earlier about taking ourselves to healing and her own example of going back to, to the land and this process of healing on um, the fantastic questions that she left, she posed towards the end of her presentation as well. So I thought that was um, really fascinating. And even, you know, thinking a little bit as um, the COPs are coming up, the climate change COP and CBD uh, COP as well coming up, the very little spaces that our indigenous brothers and sisters have on the decision-making table. And the fact that they hold so much uh, um, is, as is towards holding the, the knowledge, but also the, the consequences and having the consequences of our imbalanced relations with Mother Earth, with our land, capital land, I like that. Um, how can we change uh, this process in terms of being us, some of us academics here or policymakers, funders, um, use our position of power to promote change, to create more spaces uh, to indigenous peoples. So 
they have um, uh, an opportunity to not only share, um, but take us with them in, in, in guiding to this transformative um, engagement with the land, with Mother Nature. Uh, yes, so I'm sorry, opening the space first to um, our speakers to ask questions to each other or comment for the reflections in case uh, they have. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Lucy also for your presentation and, um, and I guess what I was noticing there was the link between economy and both uh, human health and environmental health or ecological health. Um, and that's something that I've actually been working with pretty deeply for the last four years. Um, I'm a part of a community that has come together from uh, people who've worked in traditional finance, um, uh, people who've worked in philanthropy, wealth holders, wisdom keepers. Um, and so we've been in, in a deep study for the last four years around reimagining money and protecting the sacred. And um, so I think that that's a, a very powerful connection to make. I mean, even, even if we, so if we want to participate in traditional or not tra traditional in, in modern world paradigm, uh, Western medicine, uh, there's, an, there's an economy factor there. Uh, you can only do that if you are in a certain position economically. Um, but also if you want to participate in traditional indigenous medicine, um, that requires a land base, uh, generally speaking. And, um, and so to be dispossessed of your lands, um, even if you have the knowledge to to engage in the health system that comes from the particular place where your people have had relationship for who knows how long, thousands of years, um, that can also be an economic factor. But you know, also when you brought up the, the COP meetings coming up, um, the la last um, time I was invited to speak there, um, what I was raising, and this came definitely came out of these four years of intensive study was really equating how we have um, turned money into the earth. <laughs> we, it's become such a powerful, you know, one of my elders says it's, um, it's, it's an agreed, it's an unconscious agreement. It's the largest and deepest unconscious agreement that humanity has ever made. That's a pretty big statement. And so right now our agreement about it is that it can become most anything, including land, including health, including, I mean, just about anything. And so, you know, my proposal when I was asked to speak at, at the last COP meeting was to say, you know, that, that for the wealth holders, for corporations, for industry, um, that wealth that is being accumulated, hoarded, dammed up is actually life at this point, that, that it is uh, life that's actually being dammed up and withheld from life. And at this point, life is screaming out on the mother earth. You know, she's screaming out for her, for her life. And so it's time for us to examine because of this agreement we've made about what money can mean, what do we do? And I'm saying it has to be undammed. It has to be allowed to flow back into the life again because it is extracted from the mother earth's body, the trees, the mountains, her organs, coal, gold, oil, the psyches of men, women, and children, <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera. And so this is, this is a huge factor in any possibility for health. And, and I guess I'll also relate, you know, what I was trying to say, I'm sorry, I got a little bit of a head cold, so I'm kind of a little wandery here, but I'll finish uh, here and say that I'm equating also um, how we really can't have true, deep, resilient, sustainable health without happiness. And so, um, it's not negligible. That's the other thing I say to the young people is I always say, your joy matters. Your joy matters. And they burst into tears because not one elder has ever said to them, your joy matters. I mean, if you pause here for a moment and think, did, did, a, did, a, did an adult ever say to you? <laughs> like, we don't say that because we don't think there's much possibility of joy coming your way in this system. We already know it. And so we're not going to bring it up to our most precious, valuable young people. So that tells us something about, about our world, but I just wanted to also chime in on this um, piece around economy 
and ecology. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a few questions. Also, I wonder whether Lucy or Nicole would also like to, to reflect on Itanda's presentation. Yeah, sure, Masi Cho. And uh, thank you for the, the uh, presentation, Lucy, and, and then of course, uh, Pat as well. It's always uh, great. And sometimes it gets lonely on these presentations, uh, sometimes being the only one from community. So it's very heartening to, to finally have somebody else on one of these panels that, that understands uh, these parameters. Because frankly, we, we need more of these voices that are able to reach into your spirit and your soul and be able to bring out that that narrative that that brings us back to to who we are and i think one of the the humbling pieces um uh in my community which is uh warming at three times the global rate up in the subarctic and the circumpolar regions of of canada is that you know our communities are not necessarily in a state of, of anxiety. Um, they're in a state of, of grief because of the change that's already been occurring because it's layered on existing grief and loss that has occurred um, as a part of the experiences of colonization and trauma. So, you know, the, the element of land healing and connection is very much a raw component as the land is changing around us. And how do we reconcile that resilience as a community with each other, uh, with our children, with, with our elders, when we see the ground sinking upon itself as the permafrost melts, as we see uh, the stars change in the sky due to the shift of the, the planet with the polar melts happening. But what's been beautiful about that, and, and I noted a comment within the um, chat box about you know, how when we're dispossessed or, or uh, evicted or moved from lands, how do we always connect or how can we connect? Um, and one of the most beautiful things that I heard from one of our elders within the Decho region was that no matter where you are in the world, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, um, there's always earth beneath you. And, you know, remembering that and, and touching it and engaging with it and acknowledging it wherever you are, uh, that that land piece, no matter how small it is, always has something to teach you. And I think about that a lot, you know, in the context of uh, our peoples who often move to many places, either forcibly or, or voluntary due to economic circumstances or otherwise. And, and what it means just to be able to put your hand on the earth. Um, Francois Paulette, who's a Dennis Udlin elder from my community, at one of the previous COPs, um, got all the folks in the ground to just put their hand on the soil. Um, and the amount of people that shed tears in that moment because it was such a simple gesture of putting your hand on the earth and touching the soil and you know the connection that that was embodied as a part of that we forget about the simple th things sometimes in the complexity of our world and, and remembering that beneath us is earth and we just need to look down and touch it sometimes Masi. Thank you so much, Nicole, and um, walking barefoot as well. Yeah, makes such a difference, isn't it? Um, Lucy? Thank you so much, and thank you for um, the reflections as well, both from uh, Nicole and Pat. Um, I mean, as I said, I felt a bit intimidated uh, following your talks, just um, really insightful, and, and thank you. And I suppose um, what what struck me, um, something that Nicole said in her talk, and it's something that I think is really important um, in the work we do, um, and something that we need to keep emphasizing is that we cannot solve these complex issues, and I suppose complexity uh, and, and understanding, um, you know, this is an issue of systems, interconnected systems, and not just human uh, environmental, but also across different scales, space and time. Um, and, and, and really recognizing the challenges that presents the trade-offs and, and the tricky choices that need to be made and, and that can't be done uh, looking at it through the worldviews that have created the problems that we are facing uh, now. And in terms of Pat, I mean, um, yes, just well, thank you so much for all your insights. It's definitely um, 
you know, sewn a lot of food photo, um, and and I take a lot away from uh, from what you said as well. And um, and just coming back to your question, Grace, about empathy. Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, it's relevant for um, for for you know everything that we said um, in terms of empathy for other human beings, but also empathy for. Uh, our environment and and you know you can't really um do this in separation or silos it really needs to um be done holistically and i think in the interest of time and i know there are lots of questions i think i'll stop there and um and yeah look forward to some of the questions thank you thanks so much wonderful thank you so much lucy we do have a question from Jerome, um, who was going to be the host for today. I'm not sure if he's around and he wants to ask the question himself. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I know that the connection wasn't great. Jerome. Hello, and I do apologize to everybody for not being able to be present with you. Some very uh, difficult circumstances, I'm afraid. Um, I think Nicole, to some extent, answered uh, the question I posed, which was really about how to establish connection, maintain connection, to return to that feeling of land centeredness when the land is so damaged around you. And, and I was thinking particularly of the Bangladeshi uh, recyclers doing important sustainability work from the outside, but actually uh, damaging themselves at the same time and the land all around them. And how many people around the world are caught in such very difficult situations where the land that is their land or the land that they can touch with, reach out with their hands, um, is, is so damaged. And, and, and the, well, of course, the health consequences, the emotional, uh, the uh, connection consequences are all huge. And I just wondered if our speakers um, had some thoughts about how uh, those situations can be dealt with or addressed or, or, or maybe not. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, good to see you. <laughs> and I'm going to agree with, um, uh, uh, sorry, I keep losing my place there. I'm going to agree with what was talked about earlier in, in the first presentation about the importance of indigenous cultures and peoples and languages preservation. Because, um, you know, one thing that that I've been thinking about in, in the very big urban areas is what does it mean for a human being to be surrounded almost continuously with things that come out of the human mind? meaning the buildings, the cars, the, you know, the way, the way of the whole urban life. Everything that is surrounding us comes out of the human mind. And I just wonder, like, what does that do to us? What, how does that orient us? How does that orient us to the, the, the reality of the fact that actually we're part of a deeply, deeply interrelated, interconnected organism of, of Earth? And so I think about that, and then I think, uh, you know, I'll throw, th put it back in there again, because an elder was talking about this recently. What does it mean for now people to spend so much time on the screen? Um, and again, especially our youth with these, with the games, you know, uh, leading them farther and farther in and, and even blockchain and Bitcoin and things like that are leading us more and more into a symbolism of the reality that we live in <laughs> versus actually touching the things that give us life. And so for me, I feel like it, it is it's only logical that we should be looking to um, the well, health and well-being of indigenous peoples who have, you know, I, I point to us and say, you know, if sustainability is the highest and most sought after technology on the planet, who should we be looking to? We should be looking to those peoples who've known how to live in one place for an extended period of time, thousand years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years, 20,000 years. So the, these are the premier scientists of sustainability. And, and you know, one thing that I say in my talks, it has to do with having a broad spectrum of ways of knowing far beyond just the intellect. And, and so when we have these groups of human beings that engage this broad spectrum of ways of knowing that I suspect every single human being has, but it has to be, it has to be accepted. It has to be 
um, uh, cultivated, um, then these people who have that kind of relationship with place, they took care of the earth, the earth takes care of them. This symbiotic relationship has been going on for so long. Um, I think it's key for us to make sure they're doing okay because they're holding a, a library of not only technical understanding, but emotional and spiritual understanding of what it means to live on earth as, as the modern world paradigm continues to move further and further and further out from contact with earth. Thank you, Pat. I'm just conscious of time which is always the problem in this world, but um, a, um, a recording, a, a remembrance that um, time is ancestral. So everything that has been said here will stay with us, I'm sure, and the reflections will continue, even though we may not be in the same Zoom room <laughs> together. So apologies to Rebecca and Lucia and Christian Montenegro and others who shared their questions. We will do our best to respond to you via email or podcast. Um, I just wanted to uh, say also that this is a webinar. It's a first of a four part series um, called Climate Change and the Mental Health, Exploring Resilience Across Cultures. Um, we, will, we are delighted to have uh, Elaine Flores, Aisha and David Finninghan joining us as a speaker and Lovro Savik uh, as a host. Uh, this webinar will be held on the 17th of November. So the link is already in the chat. And I think that before we depart, um, it's, it's nice to just go back to some of the questions that uh, Pat uh, posed to us earlier among several that the other speakers also did. What it is to be, what it is to be human, um, remembering you know previous presentations of, from a kind of cosmological uh, perspective of living on 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 the land, uh, Mother Earth, and also thinking about our empathy and how can I we participate in the upholding of life. And what is the expression of human being here in this common um, being? So I would like to thank very, very much our beautiful um, and very generous speakers, um, Nicole, Lucy, uh, Grandma Pat, and big thanks to Jerome uh, for joining in. And thank you for the opportunity of joining this beautiful encounter as well. A big hug and thanks to my colleagues from Flourishing Diversity, Lauren Kalum as well, who is behind the scenes and all the others as well. Thank you all so much. And I hope to see you again soon. And big thanks to our colleagues from the Central Health uh, uh, Welcome Center who are there in the room wishing we were all together um, in person and hugging afterwards. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you, take care.